started. So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to you. My name is Dr. Lucy Ingram, and I'm a faculty member in the Arnold School of Public Health at the University of South Carolina. I'm also the co-lead of the research education component of the Carolina Center on Alzheimer's Disease and Minority Research, also known as CADMR. On behalf of the CADMR team, I would like to welcome you to our seminar series on health disparities in minority aging research. Thank you all for joining us. A few housekeeping items. We do ask that you please keep yourself muted during the presentation. And if you have any questions during the presentation, please put them in the chat and we will monitor the chat feature and share your questions with our speaker. So on to our introduction. Our speaker for today is Dr. Winifred Newman. Dr. Newman is the Mickle Professor of Architecture at Clemson University and the Associate Dean for Research and Academic Affairs. She also serves as Director of the Institute for Intelligent Materials, Systems and Environments, promoting digital and human machine hybrid solutions as a paradigm shift in the design and occupation of the built environment. Dr. Newman concentrates on spatial perception and architecture, ecological psychology, and neural aesthetics with active research in data visualization, mapping, STEM learning environments, and histories of technology and science. Dr. Newman is also author of the book, Data Visualization for Design Thinking, Applied Mapping. Today, Dr. Newman will be speaking to us about aging and technology. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Newman. Dr. Ingram, thank you so much. Um, I appreciate this. And to the uh, Carolina Center on Alzheimer's Disease and Minority Research, thank you so much for having me come and join you today. So I'm going to jump right into it, if that's OK. Um, so let me start my sheet screen share here. All right, I'm hoping that we are good and everyone, okay, I'm getting the thumbs up from Dr. Ingram. All right, so let me um, start with, so I wanted to cover this, it's a broad topic. And what I thought we'd do is ask some broad questions, some big questions, and then I would narrow down to some of the cases and some of the research that we're doing that engage these. Um, as you might or might not have inferred from my background, I range from really concerns that emerged from within the humanities to some of the social sciences and psychology and ecological issue uh, perception to the built environment. And that background has in some ways forced me to really look at something that WHO brought up, the, the World Health Organization identified as one of the critical elements in addressing our healthcare needs moving forward. Um, probably in about 2003, they did this, but it had been, you know, in discussion in various reports, which is to look at, you know, in addition to the issues related to public health and to pharmacology, to identify the environment as a critical issue in health moving forward. And in fact, to suggest that where pharmacology would deal with about 10% of what we'd be facing and you know, public health, maybe about another 20, that the remainder would fall to the environment. And I think the first pass at that was you know, really uh, in work that had started in the really 80s, 90s, and kind of, and, 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 and really sort of came full force in the 90s, which was concerns about aerosols, pollution, you know, sound pollution. There were a lot of things that kind of emerged. And when you were looking at health facilities in particular, these things were, were of concern. Also in the 1970s, we saw, and this is related in that same discussion, sort of predate some of the official um, reporting, but it says things like ADA, which was the physical disabilities, right, that dealt with, you know, the sensory um, dis sensory issues and related to physical disabilities. And if you, we are all recipients of those codes and standards that were developed that have really remapped our physical landscape, right? You can't go now to a new building, post building built post 1980 or so that doesn't have a ramp, for instance, right, for access. So you can, you can visually see those changes as they began to percolate throughout our environment. My question was, though, really more to do with this kind of linkage between, you know, how we perceive 
how physical affects impact how we perceive and, and really what that relationship was when you threw into the mix the question of what I would say is mediation through technology, right? So, and I'll explain what I mean by that, but let me just kind of bring up the questions first, which was, you know, to ask what's the relationship between us and our environment? I mean, I, you know, this is not so obvious when you throw into the mix that the way that we perceive our apparatus and, and mechanisms, mechanics for, for perception are going to inflect that relationship. And then what's the relationship between us and our technologies? And even though my talk is on aging and I, I look specifically at aging, I, I don't think this is an aging issue. Our relationship to technology is a global one for all of us. So, so I'm going to start looking at it and ask the question, just as a human being, how does this affect us? And then really move towards asking that question specifically in the research that we're looking at, which was with a subgroup, but it could have been any subgroup. I just want to underscore that. And then what's the relationship between us and nature? And this matters because you want to think about our nature, man's nature and nature with a capital N um, in this question. So I'm going to use what's called a Grimus square or a semiotic square to kind of keep these balls in motion. Um, so let me go through this quickly and then we'll look at some specifics in the technology. And I think once you, once I've done this, you'll see why I started here and not with the examples from the technology. So the question in a Grimus square is the two corners, the human and machine are opposites, nature and not nature opposites, but there are more um, complex relationships, say, between human and what is nature, we tend to think of that as unmediated. In, in other words, I go into the forest and I am just one with the forest, basically. But there's a more complex relationship between environments that we think of as nature, human and not nature. So a landscaped environment that has been curated is not really nature. It's already a landscape that's been changed by the human impact. So a park, for instance, is not really nature capital N in the same way that, say, I'm just going to use the raw undifferentiated forest might be. Then the other relationships are things like humans and machines, which on the one hand, we've always seen them as complete opposites. But when you get more subtle about the nature of what technology is and what you think a machine is and how you're how we interact with them, that gets a little bit more complicated. So let me use the simplest example I can for most of us as moderns are smartphones, right? It's not, it's separate from me, but not really, not in the way I interact with it. So I store all my numbers for all my contacts. I don't even remember numbers now because I've become so reliant on my smartphone to do that remembering for me. In fact, the way that I interact with that device is much more, um, and much more uh, personal, right, than I do with my computer. I, I, I use it and I, and I in, a, in a sense, it's become an extension of my consciousness, a kind of extension of my brain function. So it's not exactly me, but it's not exactly not me. And that's really what we're trying to get to with this relationship between us and our technologies. And it really starts to matter when we think about how we're using technology to both analyze the built environments or to affect change in them. So man, nature, machine, not nature, what we're saying is that can happen at the individual level, the social level, perception and senses. With nature, we tend to think of it related to our senses. Man, we understand, um, and this is human and woman all together, that that's an individual and a social level. So we see it as, you know, individual in terms of say, I've got, you know, in medicine, in terms of specifics that we deal with at the body and social in terms of larger social constructs that we deal with um, in say public health. So then nature, not nature, the same thing. And then man also having to do with the individual and their perception and their senses. And all of this is sort of thrown into the mix with technology in terms of what's mediated and unmediated. So let me, let me, let's look at this a slightly different way in terms of technology environments that operate like the brain and the brain mediated by technology and the environment. So 
in the idea of the brain that's mediated by technology and environment, that's what your smartphone, that's all of the kinds of, um, you know, all of the devices that we have. And you can see that there's just a plethora of disciplines that are really engaging with those issues. So for medicine, health sciences, social sciences, my discipline, architecture, computer sciences, and the sub-science that really comes out of this is HCI or human-centered computing, HCC engineering, bioengineering, um, which is in itself an interesting hybrid, if you will, between the organic and the inorganic, so man and machine, and then even in the humanities. And this is coming out more and more with things like philosophy and ethics, communications, right? How are we managing our relationships in the condition where, for instance, I might have uh, an avatar right online that's actually representing me in a legal case, or I might have a what's called a digital twin. Digital twinning is emerging as a significant area in medicine, for instance. So I've got a digital twin that has all my medical data. There are going to be questions of, you know, security, encryption, and ethics. How are those going to be used? Um, we've run up against this with the physical issues, right? Um, HeLa lacks the HeLa cell is a great example of this. Um, so here's a body that actually um, was used without the body's permission, basically, um, in, in a number of, well, it is ongoing, in fact, in medical research. So there are going to be philosophical and ethical issues that come to bear as basically the brain, uh, our technology, or, well, our brain is sort of mediated by the technology and the environment. I would even go so far as to say our consciousness is mediated. The other one is technology environments that operate like brains. So, and this is where it gets, you know, again, it's kind of overlapping. So you'll say, well, artificial intelligence or machine learning is actually a very early pre early days attempt, it's still not really operating the way um, um, the man in the street would suggest that it does. We don't really have, I'm not really worried about a robot taking over my role at the university anytime soon. However, there is, it is the first sort of foray into us thinking that we might have technologies that are really structured like the brain, basically. And that will, you'll see specifically, and we'll look at this issue of simulations and mixed reality. And again, I think this kind of conundrum becomes um, more apparent. So with simulations, what you're seeing now is a kind of twinning between what is the physical thing. Here you're seeing a robotic arm that's being tested, but also mirrored now in the simulation. So the distance between what was the virtual, right, the model, and what is the physical thing is now collapsed. Um, we're seeing this in digital twinning with um, human bodies, right? So avatars, so a robotic copy basically of a human body that is, you know, remotely controlled by some kind of um, computing, essentially. And the twinning is also happening in medicine where we're creating digital twins to understand, for instance, your heart twin. So I create a simulation of your heart, not just any heart now, but your heart. And I run that simulation through various tests to see if I can identify, right, if we did this, what would happen if we did that? what would happen. But what they're trying to get to is actually a full hologram like avatar, say in another, you know, 15 years, this is happening quite quickly. So I, I want to introduce um, MR VR, but I thought I'd introduce here just a quick illusion. This is the snake illusion. It should be moving. Um, you should see it moving. Of course, it's not actually moving. It's just a quick reminder to you that the mediation issue is pretty significant that how I impact your sensory perception through these mediations is actually pretty convincing to your brain. And what your brain thinks is true is really true for you, even if in fact it's not true in the physical world. So the snakes are not moving, but for all intents and purposes, they are moving for you. 
this really is starting to come to the fore in things like um, mixed reality. So I'm showing you here a diagram from the real environment. So the kind of, I, that's the, let me just go back to my forest analogy. That's you deep in the forest with the woods, um, feeling the bugs, smelling the great odor. The woods themselves are not sculpt shaped for your, um, your pleasure, but they li literally exist as separate from you versus all the way to virtual environments, which are completely mediated in which I'm managing all of the sensory input. This is really happening. There's telemedicine sort of happens in between. It's a kind of augmented reality. I'm seeing a computer screen and I'm interfacing with that computer screen and I'm uh, um, beginning to uh, you know, mix in a sense my my physical and my virtual. So I'm responding to another person. I'm responding to an avatar. And there's a moment where I stop thinking about the situation, right? Um, and I begin to simply respond as I would if I was sitting across from somebody, another body, or I'm responding, for instance, in a simulation if I'm fully immersed as though I would respond in that simulation. And let me push this one more level, which is um, there are various drug companies now that are beginning to examine the issue of what they're calling virtual medicine. Um, and virtual medicine is an immersive environment that actually triggers an autonomic response that you're not in control of. So for instance, an immuno response, which you do not manage, but is managed by your perceptual apparatus, right? Um, your physical response to an environment. So the one I saw from uh, uh, Sanofi Pasteur uh, was one in which they were actually testing subjects who are allergic to cats. Um, by immersing, putting goggles, what are called head-mounted displays on, on them, and then exposing them to one cat and then eventually something like 10 or 15 cats. So they're not actually seeing cats, they're seeing virtual cats, but it turned out that their immune system responded as though it was seeing cats. So their, uh, you know, their allergic response that was triggered basically um, as though they were seeing cats, but by re repeated stimulation to these cat environments, they were um, actually able to reduce the body's initial um, sort of reaction. So very interesting, even though the dander, which is actually the, the allergen was not present, the body believed so much that it was being exposed to uh, something that it associated with that response that it had that response. It's an interesting kind of, um, um, examination of this relationship between what 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 is the real the actual physical and what we perceive as the real and what is a completely immersive virtual environment okay so these are all now really really playing into the way in which we're thinking about or you know this relationship between technology and and the human being so I wanted to look at two cases that are things that we're actually doing right now. Um, all of them involve technology. All of them involve in some way at some scale framing these questions within dis different disciplines and using different kinds of tools to ask these kinds of questions. They will at those different scales behave differently and they let us look at different kinds of problems and they're really quite um, broad or they're at really different ends of the spectrum. So the health stat map project is an AI project that's looking at data and will only yield information related to public health, basically, and it has a fairly large geographic distribution. Whereas the mapping visual stimulus complexity and the homeless health intervention, which I'm not showing today, um, those two projects uh, or really deal with individuals basically in the environment and your own sort of cognitive load vis-a-vis -vis the task that you're being asked to perform. So it has much more to do with, you know, task or, or, or um, ADLs than it does, you know, any sort of broad public, public health um, um, study. So, but all of these are going to use tech, the tools 
that we use are going to, to impact how we have framed the study. And you can't be unaware of the way in which we are trying to mediate, in effect, um, either large data right sets or mediate individuals' responses in some way. Okay, so our aims for these tend to be the same. We look at environmental factors. I'm just kind of making like this is the ultimate thing. We, we're very interested in the impact of environmental factors. There are personal factors. Sometimes some studies will veer towards things like interest in social isolation for you know and other other kinds of impacts. Um, we are always looking at bodily functions and structures in some way, um, whether that's disease etiologies or or mapping different kinds of disease relationships, or actually literally looking at you know a body and how it functions. Um, we tend to frame these through a health condition um, of some sort. So in any given population, um, we're looking at you know brain disorders, we're looking at um, diseases, we're looking at various kinds of impacts to body to function. We tend to look at this in relationship to activities, and even with, I'll show you with the health stat map, ultimately, we haven't gotten there yet, but ultimately, it will impact uh, an understanding of the kinds of activities that one, that, a, that large groups might do, and certainly um, questions about participation in those, which are actually the, some of the harder ones to answer. So looking at associations between the environment and the humans, basically uh, observing sometimes brain function, sometimes data. It's not always all at the same time, but um, data could be large data sets. It could be specific data related to something like, you know, fMRI. And then we're trying to measure in some way. Examining performance as a function of those mediated environments, understanding that every environment is mediated in some way. So our technologies are an additional mediation or our technologies are the primary mediation. You have to always be aware of that. Issues of social engagement, are we talking about bodies in relationship to bodies or bodies in relationship to each other or to the environment or all, or all of the above? And then of course, the overall cognitive and physical health that we're dealing with. So the health stat map is actually a project that we started last year. We're just now at the point where we have all our BR FSS data. Um, we've been using the South Carolina data warehouse. Our basic question was, and this involves a, a, a group of um, researchers ranging from you know PhD students to um, candidates to other people um, at the university, primarily at Clemson. And our question had to do with, um, we recognized that aging was a central issue um, of public health basically in the state. This is true for every state, um, but we were looking at South Carolina. So we wanted to understand what the Institute of Medicine and Public Health had identified as the crucial areas. The one we decided to focus on for this study was the idea of promoting system efficiency and coordination. And I'll explain how that relates to this in just a second, but just keep in mind that's what we decided to, to look at. We know that the needs of the aging population in the United States are, are significant. And this is, as I said, true across the states. Um, so that, that population is increasing um, every, every year. And the amount of funding available to support that population through either public programs or private sector programs, community programs, um, churches, mosques, you know, uh, uh, synagogues, so on and so forth, is 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 not going to be able to make up the slack. So we're we are tasked to figure out how to um, understand how to 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 lessen that burden in in whatever way we can. So our question really had to do with how could we make better data decision spaces using AI given multiple sets of data. And the data we decided to extract and look at really had to do with um, you know, the complications of aging. So our basic question is this, and since I'm not giving you like the whole complete enchilada here, but I'm trying to, you know, share um, the highlights of each each um, thing, please come back and ask me questions if I'm not being clear. 
we were asking the question, so I can pull for any zip code, I can pull an, a, a median age, I can pull census data to, to figure out what the median age of that population is. But what we really want to understand is what the health age of that population is. So in other words, are there higher rates of these comorbidities in that population? And if so, are they high enough to actually impact if we created a kind of you know, AI tool that would allow us to go through that data to look at you know, behavioral, long-term behavioral changes. So things like how, how often do, do, is there return, are there return visits to the hospital? What is the incidence of diabetes? Does it increase over a five-year period? Does it hold steady or decrease? What kinds of um, psychosocial processes link that, you know, health and disease basically in that population. So are we getting, sir, are we, are, 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 is that population availing themselves of services, right, in, in, in that area? And if so, how often? So we said we could actually look at this as a kind, as a kind of life course approach that, you know, right now when we say aging, we're all aging at any given moment. The question is, when does that aging begin to be accelerated because of lack of functional ability due to, you know, some kind of disease um, um, emergence? So, so that's what we started kind of modeling or thinking about what kinds of, you know, model specific sort of questions we could ask. So the average age of onset of various diseases. Then we began thinking about statistical modeling, and we were going to we, we we are ultimately going to use train a kind of AI algorithm to in, will input the data so that we can teach it to recognize patterns in the data. But we've actually just started very very beginning here doing a typical sort of linear regression to even see if we could find statistically statistical differences. Um, along these questions in a, in a given population. Ultimately, the idea is that, just so you know, that our health stat map will then be able to take these large data sets, run them through the AI that we're working on, and be able to kind of print out for ourselves a sort of map or to map um, those various um, first, just if there's an age difference, but then really look at some of the contributing factors. For instance, the next kind of data that we would start to look at are things like how many fast food restaurants are there in that zip code? Um, how many parks are there? What kinds of public recreational facilities are there? So that we give in to, you know, construct a kind of map, if you will, to look at age related um, or really disease related changes that actually in, in sort of push or um, um, create a kind of accelerated aging within that population. That's what we're really trying to look at. The second study that I wanted to share with you here and uh, is the visual uh, stimulus complexity and spatial navigation project. This one, we're just about to start, but it comes out of some other things that we've looked at. And so I thought I would um, share some of those with you as well as the kinds of tools that we're really um, trying to use for this. So, so one of the things we're going to be using is a software called PoseNet. This, they, these softwares really came out of um, animation. So animation has been, the animation houses really driven by the entertainment industry um, to start developing tools, you know, well before what is now kind of become ubiquitous, like head mounted displays, like the Oculus Rift or, you know, various kinds of the, the, uh, micro, uh, the holograph, uh, hologram, uh, sorry, Microsoft hologram, basically uh, glasses. So you're starting to see, um, well, it really started, it's a, it hit the markets in about 2015, all of these things that had been in fact, uh, underdeveloped and things like industrial light and magic and you know all these these various animation and movie making houses. PoseNet's one of them. PoseNet um, allows you to position 
um, in this case, a car, I'm showing you a train example or a car, a car example, basically a self-driving car uh, localization and diagram here. So it allows you to understand the position of an object in space. And then when you start to look at it with a person, it helps you do um, a kind of vector, um, 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 well, ray trace analysis essentially of their movement, pinpointing you know um, critical joints. Usually, you can see that this was where this where this led to an animation because it was the fundamental kind of skeletal framework that then you could build an avatar on. But it turns out that in terms of things like our specific study, which deals with age-related mobility, that actually using this um, as a tool is less invasive, for instance, than asking um, a subject to wear the suit with the dots and then filming that and then going back and having to, uh, uh, from that, convert that into a kind of uh, graph or diagram that you could use. This actually lets you uh, do this without, without much intervention with the subject at all. So our idea is to ask a subject to navigate a, um, here, let me show you sort of a stair condition or navigated environment. Um, here I'm showing you a little GIF where you've got a series of subjects. You can actually do this with multiple subjects. It's quite quite a good software. Um, but letting uh, what, what we're trying to do is understand um, the relationship be between uh, kind of the body schema, right, in relationship to cognitive load as you encounter a different environment. So we're going to use two different basic environments, a ramp and a set of stairs, and we'll actually modify each of those slightly in relationship to what we know should be more or less difficult. This has to do with slope and then um, so slope and then a run to rise in terms of the stair and the ramp so that we can see if there's actually increased cognitive load. We, we can infer if there's a kind of increased cognitive load given that there's a sort of difficulty in um, performing the task and we can analyze that relative to the body positioning and we can do that now using this software. So ultimately we might be able to do some kind of modified configuration based on that data to show ourselves what that environment might be, how that environment is being perceived by the subject. And this was a sort of, you know, test project, pilot project that we did a number of years ago before PoseNet, in which we were doing it with a kind of simulation um, and not even, we were asking uh, 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 test subjects to, um, well, we were simulating what they might think, but without being able to um, measure it in quite the same way that you can with the more recent technologies. Okay. What are some of the next steps with all of this? Because the technologies in terms of their impact to our research, the technologies in terms of the impact to the user are going to be significant in the next, the next um, um, 10 years. We're already seeing these changes that I outlined that impacted my own research within the last five years. So previous to 2015, there wasn't easy access to HMDs. There were immersive environments, but they were cost prohibitive. Um, they were, uh, because they were cost prohibitive, they were geographically remote. So if I wanted to use a computer augmented virtual environment, I had to make a trip to use that someplace. Um, if I wanted to do any kind of fully immersive, um, uh, uh, you know, sort of research on the subject, I had to figure out how to get people there. In fact, so I said, we often couldn't get uh, the, the, the users that we wanted, we had to use, we had to use the users that we had basically in order to do, to do some of these pilot tests. So now it's cost efficient, it's ubiquitous um, in the sense that really, as long as you have access to good internet, and this is actually an equity issue that is certainly something that should be under discussion at all levels uh, in our society and for all of our states, um, 
if you have access to those tools um, or the internet, you can access a number of things now that you might not have been able to, both the researchers and, and the general population. So what we are seeing though, is that more and more environments are going to adapt to users. This is coming out of my discipline, which basically you couldn't have done bespoke uh, home environments really up until about the 1990s in which certain tools emerged within my own discipline that have to do with the way things are fabricated and manufactured and built that enables us to do bespoke changes for subpopulations um, that are going to be much, much more significant in the future than simply things like adding hand adding adding you know safety bars and 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 checking for for slippage with rugs and you know things that we're doing we've been doing for a while we're going to be able to make the environment more adaptable to you so we're looking at things like wearables basically so i'm wearing something i'm going to be able to program your environment through the wi-fi so that as you move through that space the wearable will respond so you'll feel body pressure Pressure, basically, you will experience so you coming up to a stair, and I can actually, in a sense, make you believe again, remember, this is a mediated experience, I can make your brain believe that that you've come up against a much more significant barrier, you will feel as though, for instance, you've walked up to a wall, as opposed to simply standing at the precipice of a stair. So that overlay of the virtual and the real in these environments is going to be much more like the sort of GIF that I'm showing you here, where your body and that environment are actually in a kind of dynamic feedback loop. And you will be able to change the temperature. I mean, we're looking at things like, and I've got a friend who's been doing this research who, you know, your heart rate might be um, accelerated because you're in a panic situation and, or your heart rate is too high. Um, and your door, for instance, your front door will sense that the minute you touch the door, we've built, we've been running, she's been actually building these doors that are sort of censored sensory specific um, to things like heart rate and and it simply won't open um, so or it will open you know in a specific way so so really getting much more interactive in our environments um, responsive in that way um, and ultimately as i said adaptable i think wearables is the next one you see it already so your smartphone went from being your phone to being your watch Ultimately, I think we will be doing things that are more embedded. We're looking at um, inks that are active so that they have, um, um, they can transmit um, electrical signals. So we might be using tattoos, in fact, um, in not too far in the future. This leads to something that I call the space as a membrane. So, so whereas you think of right now that space that's around us is a kind of void, you know, that you're sitting in your room and there's a wall and a window and you're looking out and you're aware of the chair and aware of the table and aware of the wall and the light and the odors and the sounds, but you're not thinking about that sort of in between as a kind of membrane that might actually be gathering data about your GSR, your heart rate, your body temp, so on and so forth. And I think in the future with something, with things like the internet of things and sensors being embedded in almost everything, your clothes will probably could be giving feedback to your environment so that it might adjust the temperature, for instance. Or if you're having some kind of cognitive difficulty, it might actually be help you become aware in a kinesthetic sense of body location or aware of some, some sort of component of a task that you need help performing. So that really this idea of the space is a kind of membrane that extends the body senses, extends our awareness of self into, the, into a much broader area, I think is what we're going to see really moving, moving towards the future. And that will impact medicine significantly. That's going to impact health significantly. It's also going to impact our social relations significantly. And if we're not equitable about this, if we don't make sure that we we're able to get things like Wi-Fi to everyone, that everyone has equal access to this, we are going to, um, uh, you know, limit 
what, what well we're going to cause disparities that that exist will only become wider basically so i'm a real advocate for making sure that we distribute um, these things that they're available to everyone that's it thank you so much for your time today i'm going to stop my share so that dr ingram can come back well, Quentin has led the way with some applause. So thank you very <laughs> much um, for a fascinating presentation. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know about the rest of you, but it, it almost felt really sci-fi. The sci-fi is now, right? Mm -hmm. we, we are here. This is our normal. So really appreciate you for um, kind of bringing us to this place of really thinking about robotics and um, your grayness square right in the interface between <laughs> yes. um what yes. is reality and what is not right and yeah. so we've already gotten a few great questions um from marty and um marty davy and donna ray maybe follow up with a comment and or question and i've got one as well so okay. marty if you want to lead us off uh yeah that was really fascinating um uh i'm actually going back into working with patients and um, uh, probably through telehealth. So I'm really looking at could uh, help me see. Um, telehealth helps me because I can go right into people's kitchens. But the other thing is finding out how ambulatory and also I might be working with early intervention. And oh, so yeah. being yeah. able to uh, identify gate differences. Identify, right. yeah. Yeah, no, PoseNet, it's actually free software. You should download it. P it's, I can type it in the, um, let me type it in for everyone. This is what we, what we started looking at, PoseNet. There are others out there, Marty, that you could get. I mean, this is not the only one for sure. And it's relatively, you can actually, in fact, I have seen, I haven't done this myself, but I have seen people who use the camera on the computer, right? Just a camera that's embedded in the computer to, to, to actually capture motion remotely, someone else's motion remotely, and then be able to analyze it. Because really the software doesn't care what camera or where you are or any mm -hmm. of that stuff. So I think your, your, your telemedicine question is pretty interesting. Um, and, and depending on how, again, you know, I don't, as always, there are issues of like, well, can, how can you set that up? How accurate, you know, um, how easy is it for your user to, to manage all that? But once I think you address those problems, the software would certainly be able to um, capture things like gate changes, especially over time. Uh, yeah, okay, thanks. Does that help? I mean, I, yeah, yeah. I think that's a really yeah. interesting you know, use. I, um, yeah, because I'm gonna be working with OT and PT. Okay. So we could actually, I mean, we're thinking we can look at how do kids eat or yeah. how do, because you never know who's going to end up, you might up on the other end of older folks. So how do they eat? But also it could be a baseline at how do they move? Yeah. Yeah. You know, no, and no, then this is... month later you can do it again and you find out that because you put them on some kind of exercise regime, which mm -hmm. they actually did, now they are able to move better. Mm-hmm. Yes, you would be able to do, and it's not, how do I say, the output is pretty low res, in the, and that's a good thing because that means that it's not high data intensive. You don't have to have super high storage. It's easy to transmit. Do you know what I'm saying? So there's yeah. some pretty serious advantages, I think, to this that would probably help you in this space. But yeah, I, I think I think that's a great idea. I do a lot of stuff with occupational therapists, even more than PT, but, but say, because that's where we kind of meet, you know, in this space of like the environment and task performing and, and um, basically the occupations becomes the space that we engage. So, yeah, that's a great use for it. Thanks. Great. Oh, it looks like maybe Donna Ray has left, um, but she did make a comment about um, keep thinking of Margaret Matthews' geriatrician and her interest in both frailty and physical capacity of patients, as well as fall risk reduction, et cetera. Um, I have a question. I was, this may be foundational to the field of work that you do, but the, the study about the virtual cats. <laughs> and how people had, you know, allergic reactions to seeing cats. 
um, that is comical in and of itself, but it really made me think about the notion of, could we think of this differently? Could treatment perhaps be virtually provided in a way that people's robot, people's bodies respond thinking that there is some, some real treatment as opposed to a virtual one? I don't yeah, know if that, so, so that's the first bad to... question ever. So this is where, you know, the interface between my technologies, like the fat, the interest in technologies and, 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 and running into other folks who are doing things I would never have guessed or, 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 or seen. I was at a hackathon and one of my fellow, we were invited keynotes. One of my fellow keynotes was from Sanofi Pasteur. And this is exactly Dr. Ingram, what they're looking at. They are really thinking about how, he actually was hired to head a branch of a non-pharmacological intervention, right, a group to look at the kinds of things that they could affect using virtual reality. So another mm -hmm. example that I saw in mental health was people who have um, agoraphobia. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you had, the, it was a game that you would play that was a nested series of spaces. You started out in a very interior space, very safe for someone who has agoraphobia. And then they had a goal, you know, of, of moving to, I don't know, it wasn't free the princess, but it was like get the gold <laughs> or something. I don't know what it was, you know, and, and they would each, each level required that you go a little bit more outside. Do you mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And 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 it wasn't that you would do it entirely alone. You would play the game and then you would come back and have conversations with your clinician about, you know, how you felt, right? Sort of walk through the issues that were right, so that you you weren't on your own, but it was in conjunction, basically with a therapist that you work through these. So I, I think they're just tremendous. I, I know somebody who's doing this with body dysmorphia mm. where they do a scan of your body and then they show you what your body would look like, particularly uh. with patients who have obesity, what your body would look like without the weight in order to help you picture what you're trying to yeah. achieve. And mm -hmm. they don't have any data yet whether this is working, but they have had, they've done the test, the pilot testing that they've done, they've, they've had such, such intense reactions hmm. from, from users that they feel like it might become a critical tool moving forward in, in addressing. So I, I think your, your line of thought, I think is exactly what's, ha what are the next steps? The question is, how do you apply it in your area? I mean, you have to have the domain scientist who then takes the tool and understands how to use it. They don't, mm -hmm. they don't, they won't develop on their own. Let me put it that way. So then I think the question is, you know, how can you begin to think about how to address problems that, that you're interested in using these tools? Right. Thank you so much. Other questions? This is Daniela. Thank you, Dr. Newman. Excellent presentation. And it really, we really were talking about cats on another call. And I was trying to, and I was trying to understand the personality of cats and people were trying to explain it to me. And as soon as you said that, I thought, okay, am I hearing this right? Am I, am I losing it? So as you know, as part of the CADMER, and Dr. Ingram has probably shared, we have pilot scientists working on various projects using various data sets, looking at Alzheimer's and aging, and also will um, new scientists potentially involved in collecting their own data, and just wanted to learn uh, more about maybe how we and they can engage with you and, and your work, and just kind of to learn a little bit more about your collaborations and different um, centers that your center is affiliated with. So not wasn't exactly a question about your presentation, but just trying to figure out ways that we can engage with you more. Well, we, we're open to all of the above. So I'm right. involved in two centers that, of course, the Institute for Engaged Aging, you all know Cheryl Dye. I mm -hmm. know everybody knows Cheryl Dye. Um, 
And so we're involved, I'm, I'm a part of that. And then Kusher as well, which is with Clemson. And then the Institute that I do, which is actually interested in applied problems in the built environment. So we have everything from, you know, people looking at structural problems and in, in, I, I mean that literally in architecture, like structures, and then to, to, to um, you know, the kind of work that I'm doing in in that institute, which falls under kind of adaptable environments, the intelligent environments, that sort of stuff. But because my my work was looking at aging populations, like that's where I started when I was working with my 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 um, partners in medicine and occupational therapy, and with, this is the group. So then I got involved here with the Institute for Engaged Aging. But we also have people in architecture and health who are looking at things like um, Anjali Joseph's work, which looks at like yeah. the operating room environment and how to make mm -hmm. it perform more mm -hmm. efficiently. So, you know, there's also a kind of just literally the sort of environment itself in relationship to tasks that aren't necessarily, uh, well, they are subpopulations because they're surgeons and surgical nurses, but not in the same way that I think of a subpopulation. So, so I'm, we're open to all of the above. Like, like all you have to do is I'd love to, we'd love to partner. I right. mean, this is where I think more is more. And we really are, I think the one thing that we all share because we're part of these land grant universities in the state is a belief in our mission, mm -hmm. you know, the mission to really make this, make a difference in people's lives. Um, I mean, I started this because I, I really got sort of freaked out. I knew that's not an official academic term, but freaked out about the fact that, you know, that people just don't have enough money going into retirement to manage their lives. You, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's just like, what are you going to do if you have, and I think the average is something like $25,000 mm -hmm. to go into retirement. And like, I don't understand how that works. You know, if you, if, what can we do? to change your daily life, to change your environment, to make it better for you so that you don't, you can delay having to go into a facility. Maybe even we never, like, I'd love to be able to eliminate facilities. That would be my dream. But, you know, how can we make it possible for, for you to stay, to age in place longer, basically? Yeah. So and that, the, yeah. all Daniela, we, we'd be open. And I'm sure, I mean, you, you, I mean, I'm easy to find on, on just send me an email and, and, Kaylee, who's on here today too, is uh, is one of my partners in a lot of the stuff she's doing. The yeah, we're working yeah. on the mapping project together, right. and her work is fascinating also. And she veers more towards the you know brain functioning, cognition, co you know cognitive side stuff, but similar issues. So yeah, just reach out. Leslie Ross, Dr. Ross was on the call too. So we're all we're all pretty open, and and I think we share. Don't you think, Kaylee, like a mission? Like, we believe in this. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and, and Kaylee, we're working with as a scientist in the in the CADMAR. So we definitely want to keep working with Kaylee and her yeah. colleagues, definitely. That was really a wonderful presentation. Thank I think you. the thing that I really was most impressed is that my focus is always on at the individual level, you know, the, the person who's impaired, their, you know, care partner. But to see this in the system approach is just so much needed. And to see how you kind of seamlessly go back and forth is really amazing to me to, to, to hear you talking about it like that. I just, I was very impressed. <laughs> and I, I would love to reach out and think of ways, and I can do that through talking with Kaylee more, but... um. We will, I think we'll there's do something. No, that's yeah. great. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm, I'm always interested. As I said, my discipline has not necessarily been thought of as the first go-to partner, but honestly, we are the ones that will help translate this into systemic approaches. Yeah, yeah. that's so, yeah, yeah. That, we really need that in this field. It's really um, good. Yeah. Thank you very, very much for taking the time to put together such a wonderful presentation. I sat here and took pictures of all the screenshots. <laughs> well, yes. my job, I've, my job is done then, because <laughs> I totally know the feeling. If I'm taking pictures, I know that's a good. Thing. Yeah, really. I, you know, and I, and then my phone didn't work a few times, so I was really, you know, oh dear. But thank yeah, you very, worry. very much. Have, you'll have access to the recording too, Sue. So that's thank great. Thank you. Thank um, you. And so fo follow up to Sue and then to take us back to our earlier conversation, um, Winifred, I think 
the whole notion of access and thinking about these as ubiquitous technologies, um, I think it's really useful to, you know, really capitalize on this notion of how do we improve access to populations that don't readily, you know, have these technologies at their fingertips. So yeah. um, certainly I think thinking about expansion and translation in that way is, yeah. is so important. Yeah, I mean, all of this will be for naught if the populations that we've been studying and that we're trying to help can't get access to it. I mean, this mm -hmm. is what always strikes me, like with this, you know, this idea of sort of telemed, telehealth. It's like, oh, that's great. But what if I don't have an internet that works? Mm -hmm. And I don't know about you guys, but during this COVID time, one of the things we discovered, you know, especially with our student population was I had about 30% of my students that just didn't have stable enough internet. Yes, I, we had that too with our R25 students. Yeah. We actually had to purchase out of the grant on um, computers because people didn't even have computers that would enable them to access the classes because they were all online. Yeah. So we. So that yeah. to me was like a wake, like another just, you know, another sort mm -hmm. of, I don't know, ping, you know, wake up call to this. It's like, wow, you know, these are pretty privileged students, right? They're at a reasonably expensive, you know, institution at, you know, in a, it, it's nice. I mean, Clemson's a, you know, nice school to go and they couldn't access. There's something not that we've, we've got, like, you know, that that's true now in our community colleges. And, you know, I haven't looked at their numbers across the country yet, but, but probably will. And anyway, yeah, if, if we can't get people access to it, it's all for naught, basically. Absolutely. So thanks so much. And so thank you all um, for joining and please I invite you to thank Dr. Newman for her presentation again. All right, so a few housekeeping uh, notes. Most of us are Cadmer family here, but just as reminders, uh, in order for us to continue offering our health disparities and minority aging content that's of interest, uh, we ask that you complete a brief evaluation to let us know how we're doing and to give us your ideas for future seminars. So you may use the QR code, <clears throat> excuse me, do we have that slide available? Okay, so you may use our QR code here. And then also Quentin, I will be following up, excuse me, <clears throat> about the presentation and providing a link to the evaluation. And then secondly, if you would like more information about our upcoming seminars or other activities sponsored by the CADMER, please visit our website with a wonderful new shortened name, www.sc.edu slash CADMR, C-C-A-D-M-R, to find out about our different seminars and recordings of previous seminars and just uh, general information about our center. So to Sue and Daniela, any closing remarks?